I was given an audio recording that was made on a wire recorder and it always really just sparked my curiosity. It was something that I always had in the background and wanted to make a piece out of, but I didn't know what that piece would be. And just started listening to it and it always really brought me a lot of joy. When this recording came to Allison, it had no context, no names, no dates, no information about its sort of source through her research and painstaking listening to this material, she is able to invite the audience on a journey to understand an intergenerational story from sort of the turn of the century into the early 2000s. I think we have a very wonderful dinner tonight. I didn't think you were such a great cook, Juliet. Thanks for having us. There was a long time in working on this project before I actually knew what it was going to be. So when I first started on it, I didn't know if it was going to be a documentary, uh, a performance, a video, like it really was open-ended. We decided to make the piece of performance really in a response to a lot of the research that was coming up when we started looking into this family. So we realized that one of the characters ended up writing scripts and, and lyrics to songs and was a playwright. I think we had a very wonderful dinner tonight. I didn't think you were such a good cook, Julia. The performance takes the form of a cold reading, so as if a group of actors have gathered to read through a play for the first time. And in doing so, imagining how that play would be staged, thinking about the motivations of the characters, thinking about the props and the sort of historical background details, the dramaturgy. There's only 25 people in the audience. It's, it's quite small compared to most theater experiences. We came to this number because that's how many voices were heard in the actual recording itself. So in the script, you see the cast list and you realize that there's 25 people, you see a name, each person at the table has a character. And then for 45 minutes of the performance, you're following along with the script and you're reading the script. Front left, front right, front left. So the audience members are really participants in the performance, but they're not actors or performers. So it's a one woman show. I'm the only person who speaks during the performance, but I also ask the audiences to become a character and temporarily place themselves in that character's shoes. I am a Yankee Doodle Boy. So did I mention that this was a musical? That was an amazing opening number, Sam, bravo. But before we go into that, I'd like to talk about the first song heard in this recording. June, you sing it, and it's important because it helps locate us in time. So the hurry, 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 that's your favorite part, Sam. Now, it's my belief that, June, you start to sing Joe Stafford's 1951 song, Shrimp Oats is a Coming, but then you switch to a tune you've heard more recently on the radio. Shrimp herring boats are coming. Okay, so Herring Boats Are Coming is a parody of Shrimp Oats is Coming by Yiddish comedian Mickey Katz. And I actually have the record right here. transcript, the simple act of transcribing this material was a major feat in itself. Uh, there was pleasure to be gained in just listening collectively to, to the audio and reading along with the text. We, we don't have the transcription for the Herring Boats is Coming part as well. The Which I realized, I don't even, I don't know if I ever made that. One of the things that makes this family that's captured in the recording truly remarkable in addition to just their sense of humor and their way of engaging with each other is um, the fact that they touch on theater history and film history over sort of a century's time. Side note, the Yiddish comedian Mickey Katz, who wrote that song Herring Boats Are Coming, is the grandfather of Jennifer Grey, who you might remember as the star of Dirty Dancing. Jennifer Grey's father is Joel Grey, son of Mickey Katz, who starred in Cabaret with Liza Minnelli. Liza Minnelli is the daughter of Judy Garland. Now, Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney sang Yankee Doodle Boy on Babes on Broadway in 1941. There's many elements of theatrical history that 
were part of this family's life. And so part of what the show does is unpack some of these moments and, and draw connections between early silent film to 1950s classic musicals, performers, celebrities, um, and also to offbeat and very off-Broadway uh, 1970s um, nudie theater. So there's uh, many different aspects and elements of uh, uh, New York City's rich film and theater history that um, arise through Say Something Money. who got it from a man who got it from an estate sale somewhere in New York. And when my friend opened the box, there were two reels hidden inside. And if you can see here, it's actually sound that's been recorded to a piece of wire as thin as a piece of hair. Now the two recordings that we're working tonight had no labels on them, no names or dates attached, and a lot of it was really difficult to hear and decipher, like this. Say Something Bunny employs a lot of different um, ideas and tropes and uh, techniques of documentary. Um, there's a great deal of archival material that's included as part of the performance. And of course the whole recording itself is a document. It's a found document. There is a tradition in documentary of working with found materials in this way. Though, of course, you know, the format and the concept and the, the way that we employ sort of the technical tools here in this performance are different than I think um, people might have seen previously. It builds off traditions that are um, central to documentary. So let me set this up. It's the early 50s. We're in the suburban community of Woodbeard, Long Island, just on the border of Queens. Many of you have grown up in New York City. We're in the home of George and Julia, a home that you share with your sons, David and Larry. Patsy, you also live in the home. And not everyone is here. Some of you will arrive in Act 2. Union Docs is a center for documentary art that uh, presents and produces documentary. Um, we host uh, screening events and um, put on workshops and labs, but we also do productions. And so Union Docs is the producer of Say Something Bunny as an, as an entity. That's my speech. Come here. Come on. Say something. Address the union. All right, Pop. Play uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy. Do you know Yankee Doodle? Seeing so much work at Union Docs has ended up in influencing how I made this performance. Just being around kind of curious minds, I think. I think that people who make documentaries are just very curious people. I just want to take a moment to review the characters and their relationships before we move on to scene two. So we'll start with you, David, you're 17. Now we will interview Miss Bunny Tannenbaum. You're at the center of this recording, orchestrating the entire thing. You're artistic and quite witty and able to keep up with adult conversation. Next, we have Patsy, age unknown. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to that bark, maybe you're not a copper spaniel, maybe- One of the ways in which the process for research was unique was that Allison didn't pursue this as a kind of typical journalist might. A documentary filmmaker, for instance, might find a, a, a recording or some kind of uh, found document and then want to go to the source to find, you know, the, the authors of that, the, the voices that were captured in that. And that was not Allison's first impulse. Instead, she sort of explored the margins and the tangents and the and the details that come out of the text that she transcribed. Okay, next we have June Tenenbaum, 46 years old. Hey, you come to visit me when I get to go out there. You're a neighbor, and you're also the mother of Bunny Tenenbaum. You have another daughter named Lynn who's not at this going away dinner. You're married to Sydney, 50. You're pretty quiet. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say much. And I think that's rubbed off on your daughter, Bunny, 20 years old. I always feel like it's good to look outside of your discipline and to not just reference things in performance to make a performance. So the structure of certain books that are really capturing what it is to be alive in different ways or creating 
different ways to uh, represent narrative in book form was very inspiring to this piece specifically. Figure four, who were the women who danced the cigarette packages in the Chesterfield commercials? What did they do to relax? The performance and the process of the performance was really trying to place myself in that room, almost as if I was a family member myself. The performance really attempts to get the audience to also be in that position where they're just one of the family members. A lot of the piece is about uh, revelations that happen and discoveries and surprising story developments. It's about family, it's about legacy, it's a moment in New York City, it's about things that we give away, what happens to them, how do we tell stories about ourselves. For the past 10 years, I've been making work based on found objects. So people give me stuff all the time, but they don't always have this combination of something that's really fun and playful, but also something that would be really interesting to like spend your time diving into. And so this project really took me to a lot of places. So the UCLA archives, I went to the Library of Congress, and it was really interesting just to be able to go to archives and just see how they're cataloging and preserving things that really don't seem very important. I was so happy that some, some place, somewhere, uh, kept a record of these people's lives. People who are ordinary people, things traced to their lived experience are documented. Were you making some tea, Allison? I was making tea for myself. Okay. Yes. You want it? I um, do very little in the show. Allison is irreplaceable, perhaps, but I have a little bit of a background in experimental uh, theater, though I've also worked a lot in documentary and interactive. Uh, Allison in the past has mostly worked alone on her projects and uh, done everything from costumes to sets to uh, being the performer and, and running the camera. Um, it took us about six years of, of marriage before we were quite ready to to work together, but it's um, it's been a fantastic process. What should I say? Should I go into my song and dance now? You asked me a question there. What are your wise questions? Well, you have to talk loud. Oh, I have to talk very loud. Patsy, Patsy, come here. What are you doing? So blah, blah, blah. Uh, June and David, repeat that conversation. Rewind that. Oh, rewind that, please. Well, you have to talk loud. Oh, I have to talk very loud. Patsy, what are you doing? Patsy, Patsy, come here. What are you doing? So it took me multiple listenings to realize Patsy, your dog, uh, June, and David repeat that conversation. David, you come to visit you know, me when I get to Philadelphia. It's just like slightly yeah. too repeat long. Repeat that there. conversation. Oh, there's just literally a one second delay on that. Okay. <laughs> So I'll remove that. Okay. Can you stand on the chair for a second? Mm-hmm. Our approach is somewhat of an outsider approach to theater because I'm not coming from a theater background. I didn't really have the same rules in mind in terms of creating a theatrical production. So I'm learning what it is to be a performer, what it is to talk for two and a half hours four nights a week to people in a room to stay healthy, to eat at proper times, to get enough sleep. That's all, all been a learning curve for me. Now we're in it. <laughs> There's uh, a lot of layers. In fact, we're still 
finding discoveries in the material and, and uh, speculating about what's going on in certain um, moments. So there's still uh, a richness there for just for Allison and I. <laughs> and the family ended up taping themselves over a recording of a radio program. This is both the recording of the family and then underneath the recording of this radio program. I am going to bring back Solomon. The show is hard to label and we've struggled with that uh, a little bit, but um, it is immersive, it is a kind of form of documentary theater, and we wouldn't call it participatory exactly. You don't have to really do anything except listen and read. I think we were thinking in some ways a little bit more about creating a unique environment for people to partake in, in this experience and really a unique performance setting. both kind of came to the realization that working within the imagination of the audience was much more interesting um, and that there was ways in which we could sort of prompt uh, the idea of a performance or a, or a film. Bunny! Say something, Bunny. Answer Say something. She takes a hand. Say it for I'm with you. Oh, come on, say something. No, say something. Down, something. I think that a lot of the work happens in the audience's imagination in asking them to take on these roles and the characters and kind of empathize uh, with the stories of these people that are basically strangers to them. We try to kind of create this imaginary space in the audience's mind. I think we're in a moment when there's a lot of new experiments and new ideas with taking theater outside of it's sort of conventional um, formats and forms about things that go beyond story, about things that are conceived of and designed in, uh, in new ways. Play something on the piano, David, and I'll whistle into this canary. Okay, what do you do? Play, play um, shrimp, herring boats are coming. You can too. You know, you can't think of a thing to say when you have this thing in front of you, it's the funniest thing. I don't know, let's see what my hurry, things hurry, are. Hurry, 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 hurry. <laughs> That's my speech. Come here. Come on. Say something. Dress the union. All right, Pop. Play uh, Yankee Doodle Danny. Do you know Yankee Doodle? I'm... No, no, no. I'm a Yankee Doodle Danny.